Song of Songs, chapter 8, from verses 5 to 14. And you might notice I've divided the text up a little bit different um, to the writers of the ESV. So Song of Songs, chapter 8. Daughters of Jerusalem, who is this coming up from the wilderness, leaning on her beloved? Shulamite, under the apple tree I awakened you. There your mother was in labor with you. There she who bore you was in labor. Set me as a seal upon your heart, as a seal upon your arm. For love is strong as death. Jealousy is fierce as the grave. Its flashes are flashes of fire, the very flame of the Lord. Many waters cannot quench love. Neither can floods drown it. If a man offered for love all the wealth of his house, he would be utterly despised. Brothers, we have a little sister and she has no breasts. What shall we do for our sister on the day when she is spoken for? If she is a wall, we will build on her a battlement of silver. But if she is a door, we will enclose her with boards of cedar. Shulamite. I was a wall, and my breasts were like towers. Then I was in his eyes as one who finds peace. Solomon had a vineyard at Baal Hamon. He let out the vineyard to keep us. Each one was to bring forth its fruit, a thousand pieces of silver. My vineyard, my very own, is before me. You, O Solomon, may have the thousand, and the keepers of the fruit, two hundred. Shepherd, O oh, you who dwell in, in the gardens, with companions listening for your voice, let me hear it. Shulamite, make haste, my beloved, and be like a gazelle or a, a young stag on the mountains of spices. Well, it's great to come again to the Song of Songs. It's, um, this is the last message I'll preach in the series. Uh, a bit sad to finish the book, to be honest, because it is a book so full of Christ, uh, so full of his love for the church and how much he thinks about his people. It's been a favourite of the saints for many generations, and it's a favourite of mine as well. Now, if you were here last week, and we looked at the Song of Songs chapter 7 together, And we observe there that the conflicts of the earlier chapters, the arguments about intimacy and all these other things, have seemed to have vanished in the later chapters. If the early chapters showed you love in bloom, chapter 4 shows you love consummated, chapter 5, struggle of love, from chapter 6 to 7 onwards, it shows you love in its maturity, love in its peace. It shows you what love is can be like when two people are following God together. And we saw that even though some time had passed in chapter 7, the shepherd continued to praise his wife. A lesson many of us forget when we come out of that courtship stage, that infatuation stage, often the compliments stay in that place as well. But the shepherd, years down the road, years into marriage, he still praises his bride. He loves her and he describes her excellent beauty. And we saw, didn't we, that um, even though the woman had been anxious in the earlier chapters, she'd constantly thought the shepherd was going to abandon her. Here in chapter 7, she was able to say, I am my beloved's and his desire is for me. She came to that place of peace and assurance in the relationship. So you saw there what marriage could be like, and I said, well, what good is this to someone who's divorced, someone whose husband or wife might have died? Those of us who are perhaps still single. Well, once again, we saw, didn't we, that it was a picture of Christ. He loves his people. He delights in his people, and he tells his people how much he delights in them so that they will have peace and assurance. God does not want his people doubting if they're saved all the time. It says in the book of Isaiah, doesn't it? You keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. 
We need to cast off that false spirituality which thinks that staring inwards and thinking about ourselves and doubting God's promises is a spiritual thing. It's the work of the enemy, the accuser, who wants to turn us inwards and stop gazing at Christ so that all we'll see eventually is ourselves. God tells us his promises because he wants us to know that he loves us and that he desires to be with us. We considered that great verse in John 17, didn't we? Father, I want those you have given to me to be with me where I am, to see my glory. Christ thinks about his people, he praises his people, and he can't wait to be with his people. It's an amazing chapter full of the grace of Christ. Now, as we come to um, chapter 8 together, Remember I said um, in previous weeks, watching the Song of Songs, it's a bit like watching an opera or a play at the theatre. You know, the, the curtain comes down, and people have a bit of a shuffle around in the dark, then the curtain goes up and you're at a new scene. And as we pick up the account in verse 5, we come to a new scene together. Uh, so it's my plan tonight to walk through the rest of the book, to walk us to the end and, and to look as at the text and see what it teaches us about relationships, but also to see how it points us to Christ again. So for one more time, let's come to the Song of Songs together and let's walk through the text from verse five. And this is the daughters of Jerusalem speaking. I'm not, I'm not awesome at Hebrew by any stretch of the imagination, but the grammar often points to who's speaking. That's why you get these different titles. And, and most commentators agree that this is the daughters of Jerusalem. So verse 5, they ask a question. Who is that coming up from the wilderness, leaning on her beloved? So you imagine the stage is set and you see the happy couple coming out of the wilderness and the, the village people, the covenant community, they're talking. Who is that? What's going on? Oh, it's the, it's the lovebirds. And they're still together. They're still coming up out of the wilderness. And there's a peace and a trust there, isn't there? The woman is leaning on her husband. She's not a nagging her husband. She's not been like the dripping tap of the book of Proverbs warns us about. She's leaning on him. She's delighting to be with him. And he's delighted to be with her. How it sounds romantic, doesn't it? They're coming up out of the wilderness but as you read in scripture, the wilderness is a terrible place full of bandits and robbers and killers and, and, and wild animals which could rip you to shreds. It's a good thing to be coming up out of the wilderness. It's no place for a woman to be by herself or a man for that matter, but they're coming up out of it together. So that's the beautiful picture you'd get if it was all on stage, if we were watching this drama unfold. Now, as the woman comes out, She's leaning on the beloved and then she speaks and she notices something. Take a look with me again at verse five. Verse five, she says to her, her husband, under the apple tree, I awakened you. There your mother was in labor with you. There she who bore you was in labor. And often in the Song of Songs, people will read too much detail into something. They'll make all kinds of, you know, there might be four sermons on the apple tree or something. But I think the most simple explanation is the, is the correct one. As the couple come up out of the wilderness and holding hands together, leaning on one another, the woman sees the Farner house, as we call it in New Zealand, you know, they call it the Fano home, don't they? The, the home everyone always ends up going back to. The place where his mum obviously would have given birth to him. There was no hospitals at the time of the Song of Song. People gave birth at home. So she's coming up out of the wilderness and she sees the Fano house and there she remembers the apple tree. And uh, this seems to have been a special place where the young couple fell in love. She says, under the apple tree, I awakened you. You know, there's up, over and over again, she's been saying in the book, do not stir up or awaken love until it so desires. But here is where the love so desired. And she awakened that sense of love and they began courting right outside the family home. 
right in the place where his mum had given birth to him. And again, there's a simple principle here for relationships. But it's good to go over the past together, isn't it? And remember some of those things which happened during the time of your courtship. It's a simple piece of wisdom, but it can often stir up fresh affection in the future. I'm sure all of us have our own places, don't we? You know, when you were courting, if, you're, you know, if you've been blessed with a marriage, and you remember some of those places where those brand new feelings of love were springing up. Uh, for me and, me and Lauren, she lived in London, so I had to make the terrible journey down there. No one from Yorkshire enjoys going to London, but I enjoyed going because I was going to see my wife-to-be, my fiancé, Lauren. And we'd walk in the parts together, and um, you know, you're in love then, so everything's, everything seems blue and green, and the colours are more vibrant. And It's a special place in my mind, and likewise, Lauren would come up to Dewsbury, what one hymn writer called the Dark Satanic Mills. But even, even then she liked it because she was with me. It was a special place. And all of us who are married, we have those places where we met, don't we? I think Taz told me I met Heather walking on the bridge. I'm not sure if that's correct. I have to fill me in afterwards. But all of us had those places if we're married where love was awakened. And it's important to return there in your mind because sometimes your marriage sucks. Sometimes you hit a bad patch. You have to go back to where it all began. And that stirs up fresh affection in the present. And you actually see this from the woman. Like This part here in the Song of Songs is where we see the most prayers from the woman and the most beautiful language that she's spoken in the entire book. As she thinks about their courtship and where it all began, from verse 6 to 7, we hear some of the most beautiful words of poetry which have ever been written. Verse 6, set me as a seal upon your heart and as a seal upon your arm, for love is strong as death. Jealousy is fierce as the grave. It flashes a flashes of fire, the very flame of the Lord. Many waters cannot quench love and neither can floods drown it. If a man offered for love all the wealth of his house, he would be utterly despised. As she thinks about the past, it brings prayers forward into the present. It's a simple principle, but one all of us who are married need to remember. So what does she say to him? Verse 6, she says, set me as a seal upon your heart and as a seal upon your arm. It's kind of difficult for us to enter into because we don't really have seals anymore, but you know, people would have their signet rings, they would have seals and if you wanted to steal someone's identity in the past, you didn't steal their credit card and, or their emails, you stole their seal. It's one of the most important possessions a man had. He carried it with him everywhere. And she's saying, I want to be to you like that seal. You take me with you everywhere. I want to be on your arm. I want to be seen to be your bride. As she began to meditate on him, she wanted to be with him. And not just outwardly on his arm like some fancy piece. She wanted to be the seal on his heart, on the inside. She wanted to be seen publicly to be his and she wanted to be his in private. And what's the reason she gives there? Well, it's there in verse 6, isn't it? For love is strong as death. And then probably all of us recognize that, don't we? Those are probably the most two extreme forces in this world which we experience in terms of human emotions. Love and death, two things which bring drastic change to your life, both of them strong and incredibly powerful. Because she loves him, she wants him to delight in her, you know, mutual delight, because she loves him. Because it says there she's jealous for him, jealousy is fierce as the grave. We understand this, don't we? We're not in a controlling, strange kind of jealousy, but we are jealous for those who we love. And you sometimes see these celebrities now, and they're in a so-called open relationship. You see this, don't you, on the television and this sort of thing. We're progressive. We're in an open relationship. We can have sex with anyone we want to. We're not in, bound by those old stupid ideas of monogamy. No, we're progressive now. 
And the Bible says that's a load of rubbish because where there's no jealousy, there's no love at all. Where the, every, everywhere there's true love, there's jealousy as well. I don't want my wife going off with some other man because I'm jealous for her affection. I want it only to belong to me. And that is a reflection of the heart of God, isn't it? And actually for the first time in the book now, we see the covenant name of Yahweh. It's actually abbreviated here to Yah, but as she thinks about that, that jealousy, it's a reflection of God's heart and, and, and God's character, isn't it? It's flashes of flashes of fire, the very flame of the Lord. Where there's true love, there's always jealousy. It doesn't have to be that sinful control in jealousy where you don't let your wife out of the kitchen or something insane. But there is a jealousy, isn't there, to protect the one that you love and, and, and the wife for the husband as well. And it's a reflection of God's eternal character. So that's an amazing journey the woman's come on, isn't it? She couldn't even look at him in chapter one. She said, turn your eyes away from me for they overwhelm me. I'm dark, don't look at me, my skin's dark because the evil brothers have made me work out in the garden. I can't, I'm not even worthy for the shepherd to look at me. Now she's saying, I'm so jealous for him, I want to be the very seal upon his heart. It's, it's, it's obvious the man is the same throughout the whole book, but the woman's come on an incredible journey, hasn't she? She says, now many waters cannot quench, quench love, neither can floods drown it. If a man offered for love all the wealth of his house, he would be utterly despised. And you can't help think about King Solomon there, can you? He had his money. He could have probably any good-looking woman he wanted. He could buy her. He could literally take her to his palace if he wanted. To, he could bring her into the harem. You wouldn't have much of a say in it. But he couldn't buy their love and affection, could he? And perhaps some of them loved him. But he couldn't buy that. It's not for sale. It's something altogether different, isn't it? You can't buy it with all the money in the world. You can't force someone to love you. If you try, you just end up looking like, well, it's, just, it's just sad and pathetic, isn't it? I remember in England seeing this guy, my dad bought his house and he's like, there's a lovely Thai woman. She loves me. Um, she's tw 20 years old. And um, you know, the guy was in his seventies and, oh, you fool. You know, it, it was sad to see because you can't buy love. And of course, once she got the money, she sent him back in. If a man offered for love all the wealth of his house, he would be utterly despised. So that's the journey she's come on. She's now praising and, and, and delighting her husband and he's delighting in her. It's the, it's the high point of the book in many ways. So imagine you're watching the opera. They're all on the stage. The happy couple are walking off together. And then the spotlight pans over to some people we haven't seen since chapter one. And it's not just me saying this, most commentators agree that this is the brothers from chapter one, the brothers who were angry with the woman and made her work in the vineyard. And even though the woman's had this incredible transformation in the book, the brothers are absolutely the same as when the book began. I take a look with me at verses eight and nine. At verse eight, we have a little sister and she has no breasts. What shall we do for our sister on the day when she is spoken for? If she is a wall, we will build on her battlements of silver. But if she is a door, we will enclose her with boards, boards of cedar. Now that's quite poetic language, but what the brothers are saying here is, okay, we've lost the Shulamite, right? she's gone, she's off with the shepherd boy, living the good life, but we do have a, a younger sister still in the house. We looked at chapter one, it's obviously the house is broken, there's no father figure in the whole book, other than, I suppose, the shepherd is in some ways. So they have a little sister, and she has not come to, um, she's not gone through puberty yet, it says she has no breasts, and they're already pl pl plotting and thinking, how can we get the most cash for her, well, cash for her when it comes time for that bridal price? What shall we do for our sister on the day when she is spoken for? And at first glance, it looks like, oh, well, maybe they're trying to protect their sister as, you know, as brothers should. But as they describe what they want to do for her, it's obvious that they have something else in mind. 
Verse 9, if she is a wall, we will build on her battlements of silver. And the picture is quite obvious there. Like If she remains flat-chested like a wall, we're going to decorate her to make her as beautiful as possible. And silver is not something you put on the outside of your castle to keep it safe. It's a decorative thing, isn't it? He's saying, we'll decorate her and make her look good anywhere. Maybe put her in the short skirt and the high heels and then we'll get a good price for her. If she's a door, and the image is quite crass, if she's promiscuous, if she's opening up to people, we're going to bolt the door shut because we don't want our sister to be thought of as a promiscuous woman because we won't get a good price for her. It's not the brothers trying to protect her, they're just selfish as when the book as when the book started. And that's often the way in the pantomime, in the opera, isn't it? The villains remain the same to the very end. But the Shulamite, she's happy to be past all that. She's happy to be with the shepherd. She says, I was a wall, verse 10, and my breasts were like towers. She went through puberty. Then I was in his eyes as one who finds peace. She managed to escape King Solomon's harem in chapter 1. She managed to um, come away from her brothers the whole book and she was with the shepherd and he brought her peace. It was a good job that he found her, wasn't it? Otherwise, who knows what the brothers or who the brothers might have sold her to. There's a final contrast the woman gives here, which is why I also believe that Solomon and the shepherd are not the same person as some people do. Listen to the contrast the woman gives as she walks with her beloved. Verse 11. Solomon had a vineyard at Baal Hamon. He let out the vineyard to keepers. Each one was to bring for its fruit a thousand pieces of silver. But my vineyard, my very own, is before me. You, O Solomon, may have the thousand and the keepers of the fruit... 200. And there's a lot of detail there, a lot of talk of vineyards, but the point is this. It's better to be poor with the shepherd boy than to be rich with King Solomon. So you have your fancy vineyard, Solomon. I've got the vineyard of love right in front of me. And I wouldn't trade it for anything. I wouldn't trade it for all your wealth, all your riches. I don't want anything, anything which you can offer. Keep it for yourself. And the spotlight turns on the couple once more and we see the outro, if you like. The shepherd speaks, verse 13. O oh, you who dwell in the gardens with your companions listening for your voice, let me hear it. In other words, come closer. I want to hear you. I want to see you. I want to be with you. And the woman now says, verse 14, make haste, my beloved, and be like a gazelle or a young stag. On the mountains of spices. And that's a throwback to earlier in the book. Earlier she said, be like the deer jumping over the hills. You need to get away from my family home. I can't go on this walk into the countryside with you. But now she says, come to me. Be like a, a doe or a gazelle toward me, not away from me. She wants, he, she wants him to come to her. And so there's been a dramatic change in the woman in the Song of Songs, and it does end happily ever after. You know, a lot of films these days, they don't end so well, but this is, a, is the story of all stories, isn't it? Out of the wilderness and back into the garden paradise. It's the story of all stories. It's a return to Eden. It's a return to that time when they walk with God together in the cool of the day, they're naked, and they feel no shame at all. It's a beautiful book. And it ends beautifully. But it also reminds us, as I said before, that our marriages are often nothing like this. This is a love so pure and so, so holy and perfect. None of us come close to this at all, do we? We actually annoy one another, if we're honest, don't we? And two sinners live together, they rub each other up the wrong way. There's none of that here. All is peace and pleasantness and perfection. And that's because it's not just a book about human love. It's a book about Christ and his church. 
It's a book about him. And we'll see that now. Just walk us through again and show us how these things are actually fulfilled in Christ. There's a beautiful picture here, isn't it? How did the chapter begin? It began with the bride coming up out of the wilderness with her beloved, leaning on him, and he's carrying her, he's walking with her, he's bringing her out of that terrible, dangerous place. And brothers and sisters, one day the Lord Jesus will come back for us. He said, let not your hearts be troubled. Do you believe in God? Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you that where I am there, you may be also. He goes away, but he's, he's coming again with us. And he will bring us out of this filthy, howling wilderness. You know, where there are witches and devils and traps and pitfalls where we have to struggle against our sin daily, mortify and crucify the flesh and put off the old man and put on the new man and, and struggle forward through the wilderness. Now there's coming a time when he is going to take us out of all this and bring us back to Eden. But it's going to be even better than Eden because you can't get lost again. And there was a song a bit ago, I want it like it was back then, I want to be in Eden. I thought, well, I don't, because you can fall away in Eden, you can be booted out of the garden. What Jesus is bringing us to is even safer than the garden of Eden. It's the garden city, the new Jerusalem. And we'll be with him there forever. He'll walk with us, we'll lean on him, and we'll know him perfectly. And then, and only then, will we praise him with perfect prayers and perfect love and perfect devotion. Have you noticed here that the love the woman has is like the love that he had for her all along? Finally, she's loving him how she should. And Christian, when you die, when you go to heaven, when Jesus brings you to himself, you'll love him for the first time like you should have always loved him down here. You know, it's, it's a grief to us as Christians, isn't it? How little we love the Lord Jesus Christ. If it's not, you've probably not been a Christian two minutes. What did William Cooper say in his hymn? He said, Lord, it is my chief complaint that my love is cold and faint, yet I love thee and adore, oh, for grace to, to love thee more. And again, William Gadsby, these are why these are favorite hymns of the saints. He said, oh, that my soul could love and praise him more. His beauty's trace, his majesty adore. Live near his heart, upon his bosom lean. Obey his voice and all his will esteem. That's the cry of every Christian. We want to love him like he loves us, and yet we don't do it. We go back to our idols, we go back to our sins, we go back to our stupidity. But when we see him face to face, we'll be like him, for we'll see him as he truly is. it rip out the old sinful nature for good, and we'll walk in perfect fellowship with him in the cool of the day. We'll, we'll love him with the same love with which he loved us. And that'll be tremendous, won't it? Be a tremendous moment when we're never to sin again, and we'll be delighted in Christ forever. That's why Samuel Rutherford uh, wrote in his hymn, we'll sing it actually after this. He talks about being in heaven with Christ and he said, in that place, the bride eyes not her garment, but her dear bridegroom's face. I will not gaze at glory, but on my king of grace. And not on the crown he giveth, but on his pierced hand, the lamb is all the glory in Emmanuel's land. We will be staring at him. We will be with him. We will fall at his feet like the, uh, the elders and the living creatures. We will bow before him. We'll wash his feet with our tears like Mary did. It'll be, it'll be overwhelming. It'll be better than hearing about it on a Thursday evening. You can't have anything to compare this. You offer me all the gold in the world to, for Christ. It's, it's not even worth thinking about, is it? You couldn't trade him in for anything. If you offered me something else, you'd just be utterly despised. There's nothing which can compare with him. There's nothing. He's not in, in the same category. If a man offered you all the wealth of the world for his love, he'd be utterly despised. Like, get out of here. I'm going with the shepherd. 
So that day is coming, but for now we're through the wilderness, aren't we? There's a hymn said, through the howling wilderness our path pursue. We march to Zion through the wilderness before we reach the promised land. And on the journey, there's all kinds of other people trying to drag us away from Christ. There's plenty of King Solomons who offer you a different kind of love, a different kind of experience. Just to name three of them, the world, the flesh, and the devil. They try and drag us away from Christ. But we need to say no to them. What they can offer us is bondage, is damnation, is darkness. That's all they can offer us. But the shepherd, he offers us peace, doesn't he? He says in Romans, Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God for our Lord Jesus Christ. Forget King Solomon, forget this world, forget your people and your father's house, and the king will desire your beauty, it says in Psalm 45. Just like the woman, we need to say to the world, Get out of here, I'm not interested. And so the cry of the church is really the cry of the woman at the end, isn't it? Make haste, my beloved, and be like a gazelle or a young stag on the mountains of spices. And how does the Bible end? It ends with God's people saying, come quickly, Lord Jesus. Come quickly, Maranatha, come and rescue us. And so the book ends the same way the Bible ends with the people of God are wanting God to come to them and he will. He will come, he will take us to be with him and it'll be even better than the Garden of Eden. So let me ask a few questions as we close this evening. So as we go through this passage again, we saw the wisdom of the married couple, didn't we? How they remembered all the good stuff in the past and it spurred them on in the present to love one another. Let me ask you, are you doing that? Are you revisiting those apple trees, those good memories? Or are you spending all your time in the field full of manure, in all your problems, in all your struggles in the marriage? It's important to keep remembering the good times, isn't it? To keep bringing to mind at the time when we fell in love. But more than that, we saw the love of Christ, didn't we? He's coming back for us. He's going to bring us to himself. It'll be more than you can ever imagine. Let me ask you, do you have this hope in yourself? Because the hope of glory is for now, isn't it? It helps us to live a life of righteousness now. It says, he who has this hope in him purifies himself just as he is pure. How do we say no to ungodliness and yes to righteousness? It's by fixing our eyes on what's ahead, isn't it? On the grace that will be given to us. That's why Peter says, as obedient children, fix your eyes fully on the grace that will be, is going to be given to you. As we have this hope in the present, it helps us to go forward. It helps us to say no to the world, the flesh and the devil and to look forward to being with Christ forever. Finally, do you have that desire as Paul did to, Depart and be with Christ. And the Apostle Paul could say, couldn't he? He said, which shall I choose? I'm not sure. Shall I stay here and enjoy the fruitful labor? It's one one option. But I also have a desire to depart and be with Christ, which is far better. Do you have that desire? Because if you're a Christian, you should be looking forward to it. We're not going to shrink in shame from him as he's coming because we're going to be dressed in his righteousness. The gospel is is about getting us ready for the wedding feast, isn't it? The robe of righteousness which we put on is given to us freely in Christ. If you got your garments on, are you waiting for the wedding? It will come. And in the meantime, we say, make haste, my beloved, and be like a gazelle or a young stag on the mountains of spices. Amen.